I'm Christine Cornells, and welcome to Her Story. Today, we have two very special guests. One is Dr. Mary Cleave. She is a former astronaut, a former associate administrator of NASA, and someone that I'm very much looking forward to talking to. We also have Dr. Claire Parkinson, and she is a project scientist at NASA Goddard. And as an engineer, I am very much looking forward to talking to these two ladies, to finding about, out about their career, about what brought them to the space exploration uh, world, just being able to learn more about uh, their experiences and what sort of things have they learned that the rest of us can also enjoy. So we're glad to have you with us. Now, don't touch that remote, because we'll be right back. Uh, Dr. Mary Cleave and uh, Dr. Norm Thaggard to install an escape system in the orbiter was made. They will be putting on uh, their parachutes, communications cap, survival equipment in the white room, uh, uh, being led out really by uh, mission specialist uh, Norm Thaggard, uh, Mark Lee, uh, Mary Cleave, and the uh, commander and pilot, uh, uh, Commander Dave Walker waving. The nozzle gimbal profile underway, T minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, and liftoff. All three engines will be throttled back to 65 percent performance as the vehicle passes through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Well, welcome back. I'm Christine Cornells with Her Story, and we have two wonderful guests with us. Thank you so much for coming. We have Dr. Mary Cleave, former astronaut and former associate administrator at NASA. And we also have Dr. Claire Parkinson, who's a project scientist at NASA Goddard. Uh, thank you both for coming. Just really appreciate being able to have you on the show. Thank you Glad very much. Yes. I'd, I'd be interested in just kind of hearing your stories a little bit about um, what you did at NASA and, and what your role was. I'll start with you, Dr. Cleave. Uh, well, I was really lucky. I, I graduated from college and uh, wanted to be an astronaut and so luckily uh, when I applied the second time um, I was hired so I started working for NASA in Houston Texas in the astronaut corps did that for uh, a decade and I'm the kind of person that likes to change totally change things every 10 years so my next 10 years were at Goddard Space Flight Center and I worked as a project manager on SeaWiffs which is a little ocean color ocean study spacecraft. We measured all the plants on the planet every 48 hours. And then I finished my last 10 years down at NASA headquarters um, working as an administrator and that was very interesting. I started in strategic planning for Earth Sciences and then finished off um, running the science department which was interesting. Oh, that would be Really cool. interesting because I had all the spacecraft. I had the Mars, I had um, astrophysics and the sun and earth science. So it was really a very varied so group you had, of people. So you had to help <laughs> decide kind of where the priorities were, I guess. For yeah, as a, yes, I and mean, you get to be the selection official, so you decide who's going to get funding. So you decide what spacecraft is going to get built next. So it's a, a very important job, and, um, and it, it takes a lot of time and thought. But you have a lot of help because you have a staff that's really good. And um, most of the selections are done through peer review, so um, you just you know, make a decision based on the recommendations of, of all the peers that are part of a team effort yes. then. Yes. Yeah, so you must be able to look up at the night sky and see a lot of kind of things that you work on yes. up there. Or and it's down. really exciting. It really is. Oh, that's so. fantastic. Well, thank you very much again for coming. You're welcome. Dr. Parkinson, so yeah, tell me a little bit about what you do at Goddard. Okay, I got to Goddard back in 1978. So it was when satellites were still pretty new. Mm. And my field of research is looking at sea ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic. So it's ice floating around on the oceans. And um, Goddard at that time was getting groups together to try to figure out what information can we learn about the Earth from these new instruments that are up in space. Um, and so I was in a group that was looking at sea ice and for the first many years, it was just try to see how you can best determine something about the ice cover from the satellite data. And then after a while, when we got that down, 
it became, wow, look at changes are happening. And so then we started looking at the uh, trends of the ice cover. And a lot of people have probably heard that the Arctic ice has been decreasing over the last few decades. The uh, sol most solid evidence for that is from the satellite data. And so mm. it's from, uh, a lot has been from our work at Goddard. Um, but at the same time, the Antarctic ice has been increasing. So there's been a lot of um, interest in trying to figure out why, why there are the differences in the two hemispheres. And uh, as of 1993, in addition to my sea ice research, I became project scientist of, of an, a satellite called Aqua. The Aqua satellite is up in orbit now. It got launched in 2002, so there's a many oh. years, many years <laughs> of, uh, of work before a satellite actually gets up and launched. And it's mm -hmm. taking all sorts of observations about all sorts of aspects of the, of the Earth systems, atmosphere, oceans, land, ice. Uh, so it's, um, as Mary was saying, it's exciting to be able to feel that you're doing something important. And this satellite, the Aqua satellite that I'm one of the participants mm -hmm. in, I mean, this is getting a lot of information, not just for scientists, but also practical information for um, the, uh, the, for weather forecasting, for uh, looking at fires around the world. So it's got multiple practical as well as scientific uh, purposes. Well, we're excited actually to see the clip that you brought for us to be able okay. to see your satellite right. be launched into orbit, I believe. Yes, So indeed. we'll, I've we'll got show you the around. clip right now. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Thank you. 10, 9, 8, Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and we have liftoff of NASA's Aqua spacecraft designed to study the Earth's water systems. So we got to see a little bit of what Project Aqua is with the satellite launch. And Dr. Parkinson, what is it about sea ice in particular that is useful to study for understanding uh, Earth? Uh, the uh, sea ice spreads over vast areas of both the Arctic and the Antarctic. It's ice that's formed in the sea. So it's like lake ice, except it's formed in the ocean. So it's got a slight salt content. Um, and the fact that you've got it spread over a huge area has a lot of impacts on the climate. And if you think about what ice looks like, it looks white, whereas the ocean looks really dark. Mm -hmm. Well, that contrast means that when the sun's radiation comes down and hits the ice, most of it's getting reflected off, goes back to space. If the ice disappears, the ice isn't there, the sun's radiation comes down, it goes into the ocean, stays within the Earth's system, and helps to warm up the Earth system. So the presence or the absence of the ice really does matter to the Earth's climate. And who else, so I understand that Project Aqua allows you to, to observe sea ice. And it sounds like there's other systems that allows you to observe as well. Right. Who else gets access to, to the data with Project Aqua? Uh, everybody can have access to the Aqua data. One thing that's been wonderful about NASA from the beginning is NASA's data sets are available to, to everybody. So everybody's got access. There are lots of websites that you can get access to the various different data sets from, from Aqua and from all sorts of other NASA satellites too. But like in Aqua's case, there are six different instruments on it and you can go to websites for any of those instruments or groups of those instruments. And then uh, some of them uh, will have data sets for vegetation, some will have data sets for sea ice, some will have data sets for like temperatures of the um, atmosphere or temperatures of the surface and all sorts of data sets. And they're all available. So 
people can get hold of. Oh, that's them. fantastic. Yeah. We're here with these two wonderful ladies, Dr. Parkinson, Claire, and Dr. Cleve, Mary. I uh, want to talk to each of you about the books that you have written. Mary, um, tell me a little bit about your book uh, called Astronaut. Actually, it was, it was written by, by Muriel Schloss, and I worked on it with her when she was, it was a series that was done for the uh, Vermont Teachers Laboratory in Brattleboro, Vermont, and they have veterinarian, uh, geologists, and other women scientists, and there was a whole series of books. Each one um, was sort of promoting a different career that girls could consider, and it's designed for middle school girls. Um, to get them interested and so I just spent time with Muriel and we talked a lot about what it was like to fly in space and so she actually worked with me around my second flight and we, we uh, went through it so everybody could come along. Oh that's fantastic. Yeah. Have you been able to talk to some middle, middle school students who've uh, looked at your book? To yeah actually it, it's amazing if I go out and give a talk sometimes you know in different schools and stuff it's, I'm always amazed because there are girls that will come up afterwards and go I read about you when I was in junior high school and I look at them and I go oh you look a little old because the book was <laughs> published in 1990 <laughs> but they're, they're still reading it so. Yeah. Is that the time that most astronauts get interested in becoming an astronaut? Is well I think it's it's a time it's important time for for girls to understand that this is an option for them. Mm -hmm. And so they, they do have lots of things that they could do that are classically done by women, which are all important careers, and, but then there are others that weren't available um, necessarily for a prolonged period of time for women. They're, o they're open now and they should think about it. So yes, that's well, that's I, I hope actually today's show will help inspire some girls so. and, and even parents who have young girls to consider becoming an astronaut or a, and a scientist as well. And Claire, tell me a little bit about your book um, it looks like it's talking about kind of the it's the about the images from the satellites, telling us more about our, our Earth's environment. Uh, yes, it's basically an introduction to using the satellite data, and it, um, for instance, explains that uh, the type of radiation that our eyes see, which is called visible radiation, if you've got an instrument up in space that measures using visible radiation, it will have all the advantages of our eyes but also the disadvantages. And if you think about like trying to get a data set for things that are going on at the surface, whether it's sea ice or sea surface temperature or vegetation cover, or anything else that's at the surface, if you're like up in a plane looking down, a lot of times you can see great things at the surface, but if it's night out, you can't see them. If there's clouds in the way, you can't see them. And so, a lot of times we don't use the visible radiation on our satellite instruments. Instead, we'll use another portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. For the sea ice studies that I do, a lot of times we use microwave radiation. And two huge advantages of the microwave radiation is the microwaves go straight through the clouds. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, as long as you pick carefully which particular microwave wavelengths you're using, and so therefore, you can get your data at the surface, even if it's cloudy out. You can essentially, the instrument can see through the clouds. And also, the microwaves are coming from the Earth system. You do not need sunlight in order to get your data. So the book goes into explaining the, the advantages and disadvantages, for instance, of the visible versus the microwave versus the infrared. And then it gives examples. Um, so it gives examples for the sea ice and snow cover and vegetation and volcano, volcano conditions. So um, that's, uh, and, and it is written for uh, educational purposes. There are questions at the end of each section and answers in the back of the book. So it can be used by teachers it, at, yes. at all levels? Or what levels do you recommend? Uh, actually, it's been used both as an introductory book at the university level, and it's also been used in high schools. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you for bringing this for us. And this is called Earth from Above. And Mary, I did want to ask you, um, what inspired you to become an astronaut? It sounded like it was something you were interested in from a young age. Well, actually, I never considered being an astronaut when I was a little girl, because they were all men with crew cuts, and you know, I never even really thought about it. And when I graduated, I started flying when I was 14. I really liked airplanes. and I. Start, I had a private license when I was 17. Uh, so when I got out of undergraduate school, I wanted to be an airline stewardess, which is what women did in aviation at that point in time. Uh, but I was two inches too short. 
So I went on to graduate school, and um, in the meantime, there was a lot of activity going on for with affirmative action and laws that, that made it impossible for people to discriminate against women. And all of a sudden, the astronaut corps opened up. And so when the shuttle was going to fly, NASA went ahead and advertised for scientists and engineers to go work in space. And I was a civil environmental engineer who uh, found out that um, they wanted uh, to hire women. And I also could fly little airplanes. And um, so, so it helps to be a pilot as well yes. as a scientist or engineer. I yeah. think so, because you're flying in T-38s a lot, so you, you know, and you're with pilots all the time, so it sort of helps if you like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and I was lucky and I got hired, so it was just serendipitous. In fact, the engineer I was working with at the Utah Water Research Lab that came in, he had seen the ad in the Logan Post Office, right up to the, next to the 10 most wanted in the Logan Post Office. Oh my goodness. <laughs> saying that NASA was looking for scientists and engineers to go work in space, and so I was lucky. I got in. Oh, so. fantastic. So you kept your eyes open. I'm really glad you were able to do that. And, yeah. um, and we actually have a few more, I have another um, clip for Mary from her time in space, and we look forward to uh, seeing that. We'll share that with you now. Everything down here looks real good to us. You have a preliminary go for orbit ops and getting out of the suits. I was uh, real happy to get a chance to look at the globe from orbit, uh, being an environmental type. It was a great treat. We uh, got to eat Thanksgiving dinner together on orbit, which was a real different Thanksgiving dinner than I'd ever had before. Here's Charlie starting off with the uh, shrimp cocktail. Of course, Rodolfo was serious as usual. We never laughed at each other when we sort of made little mistakes. Uh, seating at dinner or seven is a little different in space because, you, as you can see, you can sit on a wall, sit on a floor, and also sit on the ceiling. Um, we had irradiated turkey out of little green bags, uh, same color as U.S. Army eats, I believe, Woody. And uh, it was actually pretty good. You had to be a little careful uh, uh, to keep the fluid on the turkey. We had fresh bread. Um, we had the uh, treat of having tortillas on orbit, be probably because Rodolfo was there. And we found out that they are by far preferable to bread making sandwiches when there's no gravity. <laughs> that was really interesting. Um, uh, Mary, what was it like to experience Thanksgiving in space? Well, we had, a, we had a good time because it was um, so exciting to be in low Earth orbit and, and uh, eating together as a crew. Um, it, of course, the food was a little different because it's all dehydrated and you rehydrate it, and although the, the meat is irradiated and you get it in a pack. But um, it, it was so you just still great have fun. turkey. Yeah, <laughs> because we, we were, I mean, you know. How many times do you get a chance to sit on the ceiling when you eat Thanksgiving dinner? Oh, yeah. So it's really a different experience. And, and what is it like being up there in space being, I mean, I, I guess you're not really that much closer to the stars than we already are from Earth, but just how, how does the atmosphere look uh, different from up there than it does here on the Earth? Well, Claire was saying earlier, the atmosphere of the Earth is just a little th thin layer. And so mm -hmm. it's really, it gives you the idea of just what, we have just this little layer around us that keeps us whole and being able to survive. And then once you get out of that, where you are in the space shuttle, um, it, it's uh, very different. It, it, at night, which is every 45 minutes, if you want to see the stars, you've got to bring the lights down on the spacecraft. And then as your eyes dark adapt, you look out, and there's no atmosphere between you and the stars, so they don't twinkle. Mm. So you can just see, and you can see so many of them. I don't know if you've ever been in a really dark place, away from all the extraneous lights, and you look up and you can see many stars. Well, you can see even more from low, from low Earth orbit, and you can see the colors better. So, you know, when you, when you read in astronomy class, this is a red star, or, you know, Oh, yeah, that really is. So it makes it a lot easier. And as a flight engineer on my first flight, I was a navigator. And you, just like old sailing ships, you use a COAS and you make marks on stars to make sure you, you're aligned properly. And so you know where you're going. Your navigation system knows where it's going. And 
So um, I had to identify the stars. And the first time I looked out, I went, oh, there's so many of them. Oh. But then I could figure out, and it was really easier because you could pick out colors and stuff. So once you got, I settled down and realized, wow, this is really easier because you can see more. There's no atmosphere. You must be so disappointing to be back on Earth and then to see so many oh. fewer stars. <laughs> and around a city. Especially I mean, around the city. You, yeah. There's so much light, you can't see yes. anything. Yeah, well, Mary and Claire, thank you so much. We're going to go to a break. We'll be thank right you. back. And welcome back. And we were just mentioning the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and math. Did I get that right? Yes, you got that perfect. And I understand there's an event coming up here at the Maryland Women's uh, Heritage Center in November? Yes, and um, we are extremely pleased to be involved in that. Uh, both Mary and I have been involved now for quite a few months, and um, what NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, which is where I work. Uh, the two key things we uh, produced to be uh, used at this exhibit at the Maryland Women's Heritage Center are a book that Mary will talk about in a few minutes and a poster. That oh, great. I, well, we've got a set of six posters. Oh, great. And so this, okay. this is a you can sample help me with one. Show it. Um, I still want to see your face. Okay. <laughs> Make sure. Uh, so, this is a, a sample of the six posters. And um, this one uh, is about a mission to Mars. And oh, wow. it's really cool in terms of uh, the Curiosity rover right down in this picture here is going to be launched, uh, scheduled for next month, uh, going to be launched to Mars. It's going to carry on it an instrument called the SAM instrument that stands for Sample Analysis at Mars. The SAM instrument, which was uh, built and worked on at Goddard. Um, here's one of the females who is heavily involved in the SAM instrument. And that's Florence Tan, and she's down here at the bottom. So it gives of the a poster. little bio of her. Yeah, all, all these, um, oh, all the, well, five of the six posters are organized such that you see a uh, really exciting NASA mission mm -hmm. on the top, and then you see on the bottom nine women who are involved in that mission one way or another. And so there are three huge messages here. One is. You do really exciting things with uh, an organization like NASA does really exciting things. Second, there are all sorts of ways to be involved in these really exciting things. I mean, this includes like an electrical engineer, systems engineer, an applied mathematician. I mean, there are all sorts of ways. Um, one of these women over here, she's specifically looking at examining how can you get less of the fuel to evaporate as you go all the way to Mars, that you've got enough to come all the way back. I mean, you know, wow. strange things like that. And then the three at the bottom are all scientists, planetary scientists who study the planets. Um, and so, uh, so the second main message, after NASA does extremely exciting things, the second main message is uh, there are lots of ways to be involved in these missions. Mm -hmm. And then the third is look at all these women who are involved in these missions. Now, of course, you could have a set with men, but whether it's men or women, uh, it's just an incredible variety of ways that you can be involved, and women have taken very important roles. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. And Mary, I understand you have uh, another product for yeah, this the upcoming event. Yeah, goes on. Yeah, they, for the exhibit here, which is, you know, for um, celebrating Maryland's women in science, technology, engineering, and math. And we're really excited to be a, a part of that it, larger exhibit, but with Goddard being a, a large example of how women are involved. And um, the booklet, which also goes along with these posters, is over 100 women, um, oh, wow. many of which are highlighted on the posters. And they uh, actually submitted themselves a write-up of what they do, their job description, so you can get a really good idea of the variety of ways you can support um, missions. And also, um, there's a quote from each woman on the bottom, so you hear exactly, in her own words, how she feels about her job. And so it's a very good way for you to get an idea of the depth of information 
and the variety of things you can do if you're interested in working in this field. And coming from all the disciplines, science, the technology, Absolutely. engineering, and math. So this is the upcoming event, November 14th at the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. Uh, yes. Fantastic. Well, we all hope that you can come and join us and to see these posters that are going to be showing um, the incredible things that NASA is doing at Goddard and also to be able to learn a lot more about individual contributors to each of the process and how you could even consider as if, if you are still trying to figure out what discipline that you're going into that you would consider the science, the technology, and the engineering and the math disciplines so that you too one day we could be interviewing you on her story. Can you provide us with any uh, contact information? Well, the uh, main website for NASA is www.nasa.gov. So, www.nasa.gov. Great. Any last thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? Um, it's such an honor to be a scientist, especially at NASA. And um, it's a career that I would just hugely recommend for um, children uh, who are thinking about what they might want to do. There's so many options out there. If you get a background in science, math, engineering, technology. So make sure you take the science and math yeah. courses. Yeah. You're listening and, kids, right? And <laughs> you don't have to like every science course. You could be a great scientist in one field and absolutely hate other fields of science. So don't feel you have to like every one. And even one that you might not like today, something might catch your attention a few years from now with a different teacher or a different book or just seen something in the mm -hmm. newspapers or something. But there's so many options if, you, if you've if got a solid background in the so-called STEM subject matter. And STEM stands STEM for? STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Great. Great. Well, thank you, Claire. Well, thank you. Yeah. Christine, thank you. And Mary, yeah, any last thoughts? Yeah, following up on what Claire said, I agree with everything she said. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, um, I'd like to give a pep talk for not giving up on math because when I was in junior high school, I really didn't like math, but I knew I wanted to be a scientist, so I kept studying it. And um, I actually didn't like math until I got into differential equations, because that's when math becomes a language, and you can start sp speaking with it. And um, when I did my research in college, I mean, if you're working on, on river models or large models, it, 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 it's actually a way for you to communicate with things that don't have a language, like rivers, or, or anything, in fact. So math is a very, very empowering language. It's just, but you need to struggle your way through the first parts of it to get to the really good part. That's great. Well, thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on Her Story, where we're adding her story to his story and making it our story. Thank you again for joining us, and see you next time. Mm -hmm.